everybody. Happy Friday and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is The Daily Show, where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is your Collider Movie Talk duo. First up, <laughs> senior producer John Campion. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. And we hit our moment of eureka. We don't need Schnepp or Harlock. <laughs> <laughs> also here, it's Mr. Mark Ellis. That's right. You just need John Campion, one guy who's genetically engineering dinosaurs <laughs> off the coast of Costa Rica. <laughs> Thank you. That is a great analogy. I love Feels it. It goes good. so well with Feels the shirt. Feels good to be a winner. <laughs> Shave with Barbasol, kids. <laughs> Um, hey, listen, guys, I wanted to remind you. Today's the last chance that we have to remind you of this, so we would be remiss if we didn't. New York Comic Con is coming up, and Collider right now is having a remarkable contest where you win passes to Comic-Con, airfare to New York City, hotel accommodation while you're in New York City, some spending money, uh, free kittens, lots of things kittens. you're going to get. I think maybe kids might be involved. I might be wrong. Look in the description of this video for the link to the contest. Find out how you can get yourself entered and how you can position yourself to get your hands on all that kitten goodness with New York City Comic-Con. <laughs> They the the page may or may not mention kittens. <laughs> I cannot. I do not stand by that statement. So go on over there to theclider.com. Once again, look in the description of this video, find that link, and go and find out how you can enter this contest. Now, before we get on to topic number one, uh, I was in my office this morning, as I usually am, and I'm going through some things, and I found this incredible thing. This is not. This is sideways connected to movie news, as this is a Star Wars issue. Ooh. Um, but as many of you know, there's a new Star Wars game coming out called Battlefront. Uh, it's going to be on a, a lot of the different platforms. But I came across this, and I had to share this with you, my friends. Because if I didn't, I would feel like I was betraying you by not sharing this with you, just in case you haven't seen this. But right now, Walmart has a deal going on, a very good deal special right now. That if you pre-order for either PlayStation 4 or Xbox One a copy of Battlefront, you also get this. It is a Han Solo oh my God. beverage oh my gosh. fridge for your desk. Apparently, I was reading the description of it. It has cooling and warming functions, so you can put different things in there. But yeah, it can hold. It's big enough to hold up to six cans of beer or soda or whatever is your beverage of choice. Coors Light, Mark. Maybe yeah. some Coors Light. You can put. Mark. There's plenty of room for b soda. That <laughs> is awesome because it, it works like the actual carbonite freezing thing, where you can make it cold and you can make it hot. These it's little perfect. pig creatures come out, open the fridge for you. No, that doesn't. Pig happen. creatures. <laughs> some may work at Walmart. It's funny because we were talking beforehand in the, in the pre pre production meeting. And I said, "Okay, don't tell Mark what it is." But I want to show this picture. So you have not heard about this yet? No, I know this is this is news. This is the face of somebody who just saw a carbonite fridge for the very first time. Now I don't know how good of a deal this is, but the, keep this in mind. I don't know if you can get this fridge anywhere else other than mm -hmm. this deal. Now the deal, as far as I remember, if you're a big Star Wars fan, you're probably online already. You've probably paused <laughs> this video and now you're online on Walmart's website. But you pre-order Battlefront for, once again for either PS4 or Xbox One. Uh, I believe it's like $128. But when you stop to think, well, the game itself is probably going to be about 60 to 70 bucks. So you're probably, that's 50 to 60 bucks for that fridge, which isn't bad. And I don't know that you can get this fridge anywhere else. I looked around, I can't find it anywhere else. So I think this is the only way you can get it. It's a thing of beauty. I mean, if you weren't going to get the game anyway, and it's just the game, you don't have to buy like the entire PlayStation 4 Star Wars package. You can just buy the game. The just game, the for game. $128. You get the game, and you get the special fridge. Ah, and I thought I was going to make money this weekend. Yeah, Not take, anymore. Take a look at it. All right, let's move on with actual real movie news, starting with item number one. <laughs> As many of you know, the most recent Transformers film, Transformers Age of Extinction, was a colossal box office success, bringing in over $1.1 billion at the worldwide box office. Paramount Pictures assembled a special writer's room to brainstorm and plot out the future of the series, and it appears that the first fruits of their labor has been set. According to a report in 
and Deadline, Paramount is now planning two feature films to start. The first will be Transformers 5, which will once again star Mark Wahlberg with director Michael Bay in talks to direct once again. And the second is an animated feature which will serve as an origin story for the Transformers set on Cybertron. Academy Award winner Akiva Goldsman is set to write Transformers 5 while Ant-Man scribes Andrew Bearer and G- Gabriel, excuse me, hello, Gabriel Ferrari will script an animated origin story. Mark, what do you take away from this Transformers news? I take away from this Transformers news, and I'm really excited for the animated version, and I am so disappointed by Transformers 5 with Mark Wahlberg and probably Michael Bay coming back, because we were getting excited as Transformers fans fairly recently when we heard there was a writer's room going on, and everybody's yes. throwing ideas around, and Spielberg's involved, and we're going to reboot this thing, and we're going to do it right this time. We're not just in there for a cash grab and to sell Bud Light. We're actually going to try to make a story worthy of the Transformers lore. And now it just seems like, and I don't want to throw Wahlberg under the bus or anybody else, but when you're attached to what Transformers Age of Extinction was, and that's what it appears it's going to be from Michael Bay coming back to direct, it's just disappointing. It's like, I don't, how many more of these movies do we have to sit through that make a billion dollars worldwide before somebody's able to say, we just know that the quality of these movies isn't what they should be? Yeah, I, I cannot help but feel a little bit of disappointment. By this, because you're right. When we heard about this writers' room they were putting together, where they met for weeks, it included Steven Spielberg, it had Academy Awards. On top of the people that Sinead already mentioned, you had the Walking Dead c- creator Robert Kirkman in there. You had uh, Art Markram and Matt Holloway, the guys who wrote Iron Man. You had uh, Jeff Pinker, writer for Fringe and Lost. You had like Kevin Nolan, the the writer of uh, Black Hawk, Hawk Down. You have. Uh, Geneva Robertson and Christina Hodson, who write The Blacklist. You have Stephen Denight, who was a showrunner on Spartacus, one of my all-time favorite shows, and the first season one of Daredevil. You hear this. You, they collected this big group of talent. We made a big deal about it on this show. This big group of talent, and you talk about how we are going to be investing in all the 14 billion years of Transformers history. We're going to find stories to tell. We're going to like kind of reboot the franchise. And then what is the first thing that we hear? Transformers 5 with Mark Wahlberg returning and probably Michael Bay directing again. Now, Michael Bay took to his Twitter and says, look, it's that's not a done deal. I'm talking with Steven Spielberg about it right now. He's going to do it. He's definitely going to do it. He's going to do it. And then the other thing was an animated movie. Oh, that, that could be cool, but really? Weeks of this writer's room with all this talent. And what you come out of it with is Transformers 5. We didn't need your writer's room for you to tell us you're doing Transformers 5 with Mark Wahlberg and probably Michael Bay again. But really, the the big byproduct of this huge deal is, and we're going to get an animated movie. I cannot help but feel let down. Now, there's nothing in the story that says, and that's it. Nothing else is coming out of this. I'm, I'm sure maybe more will come out. But good heavens, don't bury the lead. Like, if you're going to come out after all this and we have all this anticipation and the first thing you come out and tell us is Transformers 5 in an animated movie, I cannot help but feel really let down. I think there was a lot of great ideas that were bounced around in that writer's room. And I think that everybody was sitting around and they were pitching ideas for stuff and it all sounded great. And then you have news that Michael Bay is interested in returning and doing Transformers 5. And I think a lot of those ideas probably got shelled for whatever he wants to do. So you had this nice Abraham Lincoln setup where it's just everybody contributing ideas, but then a dictator comes in and is like, oh, no, no, you know what? We are just going to continue the story that I've been telling for four really awful movies that get worse and worse every time you watch them. So it's disappointing for me to hear. Plus, I mean, look, as a Transformers fan, I want to love Transformers stuff. It actually dampens my excitement for the animated feature or anything else, knowing that we're continuing with this world that has been so disappointing thus far. I'm trying in my head to think of the end of Age of Extinction, how we can spin that into something that at least is a passable movie. We know the trailer is going to be good. We know you and me are going to be talking about the trailer. And Man, man, Transformers 5, they are doing it right this time. I just don't have that confidence it's going to happen. Yeah, I wish... Look, Sinead messaged it off the top. The last Transformers movie, worst of the bunch, that's saying something, Mm -hmm. made over $1.1 billion. Now, everyone wants to point at that and say, see, it doesn't need to be good. Do you know how much money that movie would have made if it was good? Mm -hmm. If people were talking about it positively? That movie, easily, blink of an eye, $1.5 billion. Another four, five, six hundred million would have been added to that. Because people, what it showed me 
was as terrible as these Transformers movies have been. And I'm still a big fan of the first one. I will never deny I I really enjoyed the first one. But as terrible as these last number of Transformers movies, especially the last one, have been, and it's still making $1.1 billion, that, folks, Paramount, that means the audience wants Transformers. Give us something good, and you won't believe how much money you're making. This was a big hit for you. Forget big hit. We're talking potential Avatar numbers here. If you gave us something that people want to go back and watch again. And I'll throw a silver lining at you, though, because on this show, I do nothing if not contribute great wardrobe choices and hope <laughs> for the future. Is it what if Michael Bay knocks this, this smaller movie he's doing about the terrorist attacks in Libya? What if he knocks that out of the park? Benghazi. The, 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 the Benghazi attacks, the 13 hours or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, 13 hours. What if he knocks that out of the park? But here's the thing. This is even if he does, even if he does, I thought he did a great job with pain and gain. You know, yeah. he he did another film and some people didn't love it. Some people really love it. But I, I thought he did a really good job with Pain and Gain. So he he comes out, puts out a movie like that. He goes, oh, see, he's found his groove again. But it's like when he goes back to Transformers, it's like, I don't give an F. Mm -hmm. I like whatever. Just uh, just do that and then give it to the guys at ILM and let them make it look spectacular. I mean, Michael Bay knows action. He does. I'll always give him that. And that's why I thought he was a good choice for directors of, for uh, Transformers at first. But even if 13 Hours comes out and it crushes it, my hope won't get any higher because I thought he did a really good job with Pain and Gain and look what happened once he get back to Transformers. I just feel like, you know what? I was Michael Bay's biggest supporter when they first announced him, maybe his only supporter, when they first announced him as the director for the first Transformers movie. I'm off that bus. I'm not off the Michael Bay bus entirely. I still like a number of his films and I'll be looking forward to what he does next. I just think it's time for him to move off Transformers. So... We'll see. Anyway, what's next? A number of unconfirmed reports have emerged online suggesting that Warner Brothers is currently developing a Booster Gold and Blue Beetle movie. The project is being described as a superhero buddy cop comedy movie, which would supposedly be directed by Arrow, Flash, and Supergirl executive producer Greg Berlanti. John, do you give any credence to this rumor? And if so, what do you think of it? I give very little credence to this rumor for a couple of fairly significant reasons. One, I think it would be ridiculous. Um, but two, <laughs> it goes really contrary to a lot of the stuff we've heard and know about Warner Brothers and how they're handling their DC properties. Number one, they don't want a buddy cop comedy superhero movie. We remember that one time. Now, we always thought this was overblown, but we still remember that one line came out. No comedy. Now, that, that we always knew that never meant that we don't want to have some laughs and appropriate, but the yuck, yuck kind of stuff that a buddy superhero cop comedy thing with characters like Booster Gold, uh, and if you know anything about the character, actually, he, the Booster Gold could be really fun. Oh, it could be hilarious. Oh, yeah, it, it could be hilarious. But once again, it goes kind of contrary to what DC's been doing. Now, then when you talk about Blue Beetle, Blue Beetle theoretically could be a really stupid, powerful character. So for I'm sure a lot of you don't know anything about the Blue Beetle. His, he's basically a guy. His powers come from this this, this Blue Beetle shaped thing called a Scarab. That earlier in his comic book life was actually a magical thing, but then it was retconned to kind of now it's the uh, it's like technology from an ancient race called the Reach that would actually send it out to help take over planets. Anyway, I won't go into it a lot. The other thing that makes me think this isn't Guru is that Berlanti. It doesn't sound like a guy Warner Brothers would go to, but I will say this. There's a possibility this could be true. And let, let's go for on the assumption for a second that it is true. If it is, and they do move forward with something like that, and we're talking theoretically here, I think this would be outside of the Batman, Superman, Justice League universe for a couple of reasons. Number one, obviously tone. This is going to be a totally different tone from what they're setting up with their Justice League universe. But the second thing is this. Warner Brothers and DC have always been adamant. We are keeping our movie and our television universes completely separate. They've been they put their foot down about that. They've been adamant about it. They repeat it over and over again. Bringing in the guy who's the executive producer, if this is true, and that's our assumption at the point, just for the sake of argument and discussion, if it's true that he's going to come in and direct this, that kind of reemphasizes the idea that that movie would probably be separate from what's going on in their cinematic universe. Now, I thought for a while the Shazam would have been separate as well in its own separate movie universe. Apparently that's not the case. But we don't we haven't heard definitively that, so who knows. But 
I do not think this is actually happening and I do not think it's real, but it's possible. And if it does happen and if it is real, I think it's probably, it makes logical sense from everything that we're seeing that it would be completely separate in its own cinematic universe, separate from that of Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman because you got the TV guy doing it and they try to keep their TV and movie universe separate. Anyway, Mark, you've heard all of this. What's your impression? I think it makes sense, first of all, because you're right. There is no rule that says that, oh, because the same studio is doing it and it's a DC property, it has to be part of this universe. You can make a movie that is separate from that universe, which makes sense for, for Booster Gold and Blue Beetle. Now, having said all that, there's a chance that the reason why we're talking about this anyway is because somebody at Warner Brothers decided to float the idea and get it out to the public and see what the response was. Because Booster Gold has fervent fans and people that really want to see this get made. It's not that well known of a property, but the people who love Booster Booster Gold, love Booster Gold. And it is an interesting character that would work in a buddy cop scenario because he's got a Tony Stark quality to him. He's got almost mm. like a Deadpool thing where he's very quick-witted. So I think it would be something that I would want to see. And for DC, it would be cool to see something that's different than that ultra gritty serious tone that we're going to get from their current cinematic universe but i was also reading this and i think it, it sounds more like what would be a great television series or something mm, that would be a netflix right. series i don't put it past dc so I just want to float this stuff out to see what the fan response is though see as a tv series i could cut especially with berlanti involved if i'm not mistaken i think they brought booster booster gold anybody who watched smallville in the room uh, can either back me up or correct me, but I believe they brought Booster Gold into Smallville. I think it was in one of the later seasons. Um, has, Booster Gold is actually a dude from the future who uses technology from the future to be a superhero, mm -hmm. but he's very self-centered and he does it for gain and sign promotional deals, something like that. Very Tony Starkish, as you were pointing out. So it's it's going to be interesting to see how this all kind of uh, actually plays out. So let us know in the comments section. Number one, do you think that this rumor is real? And number two, assuming it's real, do you think that it would be in its own separate universe, or do you think they would actually try to find a way to Mish it in to mish it. I just made up a word to <laughs> mish it in to the Batman and Superman things they've got going on right now. Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. All right, what's next? While X Men Apocalypse director Brian Singer is busy putting the finishing touches on the film, he has taken to social media to announce his next project. According to a post on his Instagram account, Singer will next be working on an adaptation of Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Originally published in a serialized form beginning in 1869, Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea tells the story of Captain Nemo and the crew of his submarine vessel, the Nautilus, as they embark on an incredible adventure and encounter fantastic sea life beneath the surface. In the post, Singer also assures readers that he is not abandoning the X-Men universe, which suggests that he may also already have plans for another X-Men film following 20,000 Leagues. Mark, what do you think of Brian Singer taking on 20,000 Leagues under the sea? Yeah, shared universe. Captain Nemo is a mutant. This is great <laughs> news. Um, I, I, first of all, I think this is legit. I, I mean, he posted it was on his Instagram, and it was just a picture of the cover of a script. And I think it is legit for this reason. Is that It says story by Brian Singer, but he also included some other screenwriters yeah. on there. I think they also worked on Jack the Giant Slayer with him. So I think if he was doing a, a joke or if he was just like having fun with his account, he wouldn't put under other people and associate them with a property unless he had every intention of actually making this movie. Now, if this movie gets made, he probably saw the In the Heart of the Sea trailer and got inspired to do something in the water. <laughs> Whatever he wants to do with this property, I'd be excited for it. Brian Singer is a guy who notoriously likes to release information about his movies through his social media. That's true. And this would be another example. And I think 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, we haven't gotten one of those, one of those retellings in a long time. The Disney version is, I still think, the one that everybody talks about. I think they tried to make like a made-for-TV movie. Uh, they did the, make a made-for-TV movie, as a matter of fact. I, I don't know how that ended up going. Maybe uh, our friends out there in the uh, web superhighway can tell us if that was good or not. But Brian Singer doing this, all of a sudden, that's got a lot of steam behind it. Now, don't forget, Captain Nemo and the Nautilus were in uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Uh, oh, that's good. <laughs> yes. No. No, it wasn't no, good, no, it was yeah. bad. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I I buy into this. Yeah, I don't think he's trolling. I, I remember at first I had this one sneaking suspicion. Is Brian Singer trolling us just because I saw that script image and I kind of thought the title, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, for those of you who have seen the image, I thought the title looked like it was a little bit Photoshopped. But I know nah, it's probably legit and he hasn't. he doesn't have a history of trolling his own fans. And... This is a property that I think Warner Brothers and Disney in, in recent years, in the last decade, have taken shots at trying to... I believe David Fincher was actually supposed to direct a 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea for Disney, and then that kind of fell apart. So this makes sense. Also, 
it's really cool that we're going to go back into the ocean by somebody other than James Cameron. Um, <laughs> because when you think about it, like the bottom of the ocean, that, got, that, is, that is alien terrain. That is a whole different world that we are completely unfamiliar with. At least most of us are. Um, so I think it sounds... And the other reason I like this for Brian Singer is twofold. Number one, he kind of did slip in that he is going to be doing more X-Men movies. Mm -hmm. I thought that was cool. But he seems to be following the Christopher Nolan model. Do my Batman movie, do the prestige. Do my Batman movie, do Inception. Do my Batman movie, do something else. And if, if that's what Brian Singer is doing is keeping himself fresh. You remember, I always get kind of nervous when one director stays on a single property for too long. But we, the way you fight that is do what Christopher Nolan did. Do one of your comic book movies and then do another movie and then come back to the comic book movie then do another movie. And if that's what Brian Singer's doing, I think it's genius and I'm really looking forward to seeing what he does. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for Buy or Sell. In front of her, sinead has got a couple of other items in the world of movie news. She's growing them down. Then Mark and I are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell. So, Sinead, what do we got? A brand new trailer for the upcoming remake, Point Break, has just hit the web. In Point Break, a young FBI agent, Johnny Utah, played by Luke Bracey, infiltrates a cunning team of thrill-seeking elite athletes, led by the charismatic Bodhi, played by Edgar Ramirez. The athletes are suspected of carrying out a spate of crimes in extremely unusual ways. Deep undercover and with his life in imminent danger, Utah strives to prove that they are the architects of this string of inconceivable crimes. Point Break hits theaters on December 25th. Mark, do you buy or sell this newest trailer for Point Break? Oh, I am. Uh, I'm gonna risk something here. Okay. I'm gonna buy this trailer really? for Point Break. I'm buying the trailer, yes, because as Point Break, I'm very, very nervous. I love the original Point Break. It's an Oscar-winning film. Should have. <laughs> I, I'm such a huge fan of the original movie. This does not look like it's going to be that good. It doesn't even look like it's going to be that story. For what this movie is, the ambition that it has, I don't think it's going to reach all that potential because it's painting itself to be almost like you're pulling for the bank robbers. You're rooting right. for the guys because they're positioning themselves as Robin Hoods, who they do these crazy stunts during the day. They have this goal of doing these eight incredible missions all over the world and then robbing from the rich and giving to the poor. So when Luke Bracey characters as an FBI agent goes undercover, he's like, okay, wait, am I with these guys still or am I still with the FBI? I don't know that the movie's going to be smart enough or convincing enough to let us know, oh, no, he decided to go with that or he decided to do this maneuver. Like, it seems like it's biting off more than they can chew. Having said all that, the trailer itself, did it look more like a triple X movie or a Fast and Furious than Point Break? Sure it did. I buy the trailer for the movie. Not the name brand associated with it, but for the movie, I'm going to be eating popcorn and watching. I think this could be a fun action ride. I, um... For the first of all, the first point blank, point blank, uh, point break, <laughs> totally different movie. Point break trailer was so awful, right? It was so abysmal. I buy this one, I like this trailer. I, I do. I thought it was a really good trailer, and as a matter of fact, I thought this trailer paid a lot more homage to the original than certainly that first trailer did. When you think about it, Bodhi is, when you think about the Patrick Swayze Bodhi in the first one, he's on a spiritual quest. To him, it's not just about Robin Banks. It's, it, it's a spiritual quest to reach some kind of height, heightened sense of enlightenment or whatever, you know, all that kind of stuff. But when they come into this and they're doing it in a different way, they're not just Robin Banks. These are guys trying to pull off eight specific crimes to follow in the footsteps of some like, kind of spiritual eight feats that they have to do. There's a deeper spiritual meaning connected to it. And that actually, to me, rang really true of the Patrick Swayze Bodhi in the original film. I thought this one, I'm still not buying into the dude playing Utah, but I'll, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt for now until I see the film. But over, and I still really wanted Gary Busey to pop up in some way, shape, or form. <laughs> but I, watching this, I felt like this feels like it's gonna be intense. It feels like it's gonna have some great action. It feels like it's gonna have some terrific cinematography. And it feels kind of while it's going in its own direction, it's paying homage to the original. I feel in the right way. Look, this movie may totally suck, but I gotta tell you, this trailer is a complete 360 or 180, whichever the right one is, 180. It's a complete 180 <laughs> for me from that original trailer, so I have to give it a buy. I mean, Luke Bracey, though, I didn't have any problem with him in the trailer because if you're trying to top Keanu Reeves in 1991 at acting, 
It ain't that hard to do. <laughs> now, Patrick Swayze is Bodie, on the other hand. That's what concerns me is Edgar Ramirez playing Bodie. Edgar Ramirez is a great actor. I like him a lot, but Patrick Swayze's Bodie was a cult figure unto himself. Yes. However, you always knew he was the bad guy. Even though you may, you wanted to aspire to be like Bodie and be well-liked and all that stuff, you knew he was a villain. Are they going to paint this Bodie as a villain? Is he going to shoot people when he's robbing banks? Or are they just going to be actual guys that you're rooting for to pull off these missions? Like, are we going to be rooting against the FBI by the end of this? film i'm curious about it i don't know that the movie can pull off its ambition but uh, yeah you got my ticket all right what's next a brand new red band clip for the upcoming eli roth film the green inferno has just hit the web in the green inferno a group of college students take their humanitarian protest from new york to the amazon jungle only to be taken prisoner by the indigenous tribe they came to save the green inferno marks eli roth's return to directing for the big screen for the first time since his hostile franchise and tells the story of what happens when slacktivism the well-meaning social media response to global catastrophes turns into terror in the depths of the Amazon rainforest. John, do you buy or sell this red band clip for The Green Inferno? I am looking forward to this film because I am looking forward to seeing Eli Roth actually direct again. And a lot of, and I was really happy when I heard that Bloomhouse came in and rescued it and it's putting it out. I'm going to sell the clip. The clip, because the clip they just put out, well, it's like, ooh, gross. All it was was... It's this clip seemed to embody everything that the people who criticized his hostile series criticized it about. Just short, it's just it's just gore porn. That's that's all. I thought the first hostile was actually much more than just gore porn. I thought there was a psychological element to that film that I think gets overlooked. But unfortunately, and I think there will be more to the Green Inferno than this clip shows. But unfortunately, they chose to release a clip that is just, hey, let's put out a clip where there's these natives are holding the guy down, they carve out his eye. I think it was the wrong clip to put out. So for me, I'm going to sell it. Yeah, it did look intense and it looked disgusting. And it looked like the clip, like, like Eagle Eye Roth directing, you can tell that he has a vision for what he wants this movie to be. As a promo clip, though, I got to go with you and I got to sell it because you want to expand the audience for this movie because it does sound scary. It sounds it horrifying. Sounds terrifying. And I yeah. want more audiences to go see stuff like this. Now, you might get grossed out and want to leave halfway through. So maybe the intention of the clip was to be like, hey, we have this interesting story, but we are going to try to gross you out. So just know, don't take your mom to see this movie. I understand that. I'm actually seeing this movie in T minus 90 minutes. I'm going to a screening oh, of it nice. today. And I'm excited as hell to see it. This particular clip, while it might fit in the movie, and I might love that scene in the actual movie as a way to sell your movie to a wide audience. I'm going to have to sell it. All right, what's next? The upcoming third installment of the relaunched Star Trek franchise, Star Trek Beyond, was scheduled for release on July 8th, 2016, where it was going head-to-head -head with Mike and Dave Need Wedding Dates and The Secret Life of Pets. However, it has just been announced that the movie is being bumped two weeks back and will now open on July 22nd against King Arthur and Ice Age Collision Course. Mark, do you buy or sell this move for Star Trek? Ah, uh, it's tough to buy or sell something where I don't understand any reasoning by the studio. Like, there's a thousand things they consider when they're talking about when to release their movie that I don't comprehend. So I'll buy it. They seem to know what they're doing. I understand if you're positioning Star Trek against that really cute-looking pet movie. We all fell in love with that trailer. That trailer was killer. As soon as we saw it, <laughs> killer it's trailer. gonna be monstrous. And maybe the studio is looking at it like, well, maybe Ice Age is gonna lose some of its luster. People don't care about it that much. The pet movie is gonna be the one that steals kids hearts this summer king arthur it's a we've heard of the guy i don't know that that's good if if you're king arthur right now you're starting to get nervous though because king arthur does not want to go against star trek beyond the first two movies were very successful and i think this one is going to do the same regardless of which weekend it came out so i guess i'll buy the movie because i trust what they're doing yeah um i am this is a pick your poison kind of scenario that Star Trek finds it's, itself in. But I'm going to buy the move. Now, so here's the thing. If they were to stay on the 8th, they are facing, like we said, Mike and Dave need wedding dates. That's the new Anna Kendrick, Zach Afron, Avi Plaza, Adam Devine uh, comedy. That could be a hit. I mean, that, that could be pretty good. Also, though, the bigger juggernaut, I think, that weekend is going to be The Secret Life of Pets. Mm -hmm. That trailer floored us all. But here's the other thing. It's not just what's, what would it be opening against. The very following week... And when you're opening your movie, you got to look at what opens next week. Ghostbusters opens the week after the 8th. It opens on the 15th. Ghostbusters, The Lake, and La La Land. Really, Ghostbusters is going to be the juggernaut. Now, you move it to the 22nd, I believe you're up against slightly weaker competition. Ice Age is going to be a juggernaut. 
but it's not. I don't believe it's going to be the juggernaut that Secret Life of Pets uh, is. And King Arthur could do some damage, but I don't think it's going to be as big of a hit as Mike and Dave need wedding dates. So that's a good place to be. You're still in a position of asking yourself, though, what happens? Then what opens the next week? What opens the next week? The new Born movie mm. opens the following week. So, mm. so you're looking at look. You're either going against. Ghostbusters in the following week, or you're going against the Bourne movie in the following week. So then you just go back to, okay, then what would we be opening against? I think they're opening against slightly easier competition on the 22nd. It's no fun running into Bourne, but I think for their opening week considerations, I think they've picked wisely. I would much rather run into Jason Bourne than I would the Ghostbusters reboot. I think that's going to be a monster hit next summer. So you're right. You don't want to you don't want to have one big opening weekend and then lose all your steam because Ghostbusters came to town. Star Trek and Star Trek could give Bourne a run for its money and it's and it's it, oh, it if, absolutely if could. Star yeah. Trek Beyond is a good movie, it could totally give the new Bourne movie a run for being number 1 at the box office. I think Bourne will still do it, but man, I am now excited about July it's next It's a summer. nice, I'm telling you, next summer is shaping up really nice. Yeah. Really nice. All right, what's next? On yesterday's Movie Talk, we discussed a report in The Hollywood Reporter claiming that Pacific Rim 2 has been put on an indefinite hold. However, director Guillermo del Toro later spoke with Entertainment Weekly where he said the following, We are still turning in a screenplay and a budget in three weeks. As far as I'm concerned, it's not gone. We're still on it. The director admitted that production is going to be delayed and that the project will move further down the release calendar. As a result, he will make another film before working on Pacific Rim 2. John, do you buy or sell that we're actually going to see a Pacific Rim 2. I sell it. I, I like Guillermo del Toro, who is a genius director, and I love his work, but he is also really overly optimistic. We've, we've seen several times, actually, where he's talked very positively about some project. Oh, yeah, this happened, this is happening, and then three weeks later find out, oh, no, it's not happening. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's not going to move ahead, and it's not going to actually work out. We heard him talking about like Justice League Dark, that concept, that he was really trying to push. Oh, yeah, this is going to go... And then like five days after one of his bigger you know presentations saying, yeah, this is I'm going to be involved with this, five days later we found out, okay, now he's off of it. I don't think that's him lying. I, th I just think he's really, really optimistic. And the fact that even he is acknowledging... Yeah, I was going to start working on Pacific Rim 2, but I'm going to go off and do another movie. And what happens when you go off and do another movie? You do another one, and then you do another one, and then Pacific Rim 2 is in, in the background. Look, is it possible Pacific Rim 2 could st still happen? Yes. But I wasn't shocked when we heard that it got pulled because of all the financial realities around it. And with these existing circumstances, I don't see enough to change my mind, so... I, for now, I'm going to sell that we're actually going to see one. What do you think, Mark? Yeah, unfortunately, I sell it, too. I think he's going to come in in three weeks and have a dynamite script, and he's going to say, here's where, here's how much money I need. Here's the stacks of cash I need to make this movie, and the studio's going to be like, here's how much we can give you. And yeah. they're never going to be able to see eye to eye because to make the Pacific Rim 2 that Del Toro wants to make is going to cost way more than a studio is going to give him to make said project now if you want to say maybe they want to wait until crimson peak comes out and they want to see how that movie does so mm. if you want to see pacific rim 2 go see crimson peak <laughs> opening weekend del toro could use a hit like that to put in his belt and i look i i want to see pacific rim 2 i'm not dying to see it it would be cool i like del toro i like him i want him working on cool big action properties like that i just don't think it's going to happen in this current universe all right, folks, well, listen, it's Friday, which means it's time for our weekly exercise of box office predictions brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. It's really simple. Mark and I right now are going to try to predict what are the top five spots at the box office going to be come our Monday box office report. So, Mark, you seem very confident. I remember yesterday, after yesterday's show, you were pretty damn confident you were going to just nail this one. Oh, yeah. So why don't you lead us off? What are going to be the top Happy five films to, in the box John. office on Monday? You said exercise. I ain't breaking a sweat. At number <laughs> one is I Black Mass and Scorch Trials. I think are going to vibe for the number one and two spot. I'm going to give the slight edge to Black Mass because I've seen ads for it everywhere in Scorch Trials. I haven't heard as much about. So I think Black Mass is going to do like $0.01 million more than Scorch Trials. At the number three slot, I'm going to have Ed Might Shyamalan's The Visit staying just ahead of The Perfect Guy. So those two are going to flip-flop. Perfect Guy is going to be at number four. Then at number five, I have faith in Everest. Even though it's only opening in IMAX theaters, I believe this weekend, I think enough people are intrigued and they want to see it in that presentation style to get Everest into the top five. John, 
Tell me I'm wrong. Mark, you ignorant slut. <laughs> to uh, channel my inner Dan Aykroyd. Um, the number one film come Monday is going to be The Maze Runner, The Scorch Trials. Mm. I, I think, and I, I concur, it's going to be close. I think it will be close, but I just think that it will triumph here. I think be, the fact that it is a sequel, the first one did pretty good, and uh, it was actually a pretty good movie, too, mm. in its own right. I think it's going to take the number one spot at the box office. Coming in number two will be War Room. No, I'm kidding. Coming in number two <laughs> will be Black Mass. And then from there on down, we agree. I believe in number th the number three spot will be The Visit. Number four will be The Perfect Guy. And I also concur. I think even though it's only going to be on like 500 screens or something like that, I believe Everest will grab that number five spot with a slight chance that War Room could grab that number five spot. But I'm going to put my money on Everest. So I've got Maze Runner. Black Mass, The Visit, The Perfect Guy, and Everest, and your five are... Uh, we have Black Mass, Maze Runner, The Visit, The Perfect Guy, and at number five, Everest. Though Tom Cruise could be holding on to that airplane for one more shot at being in the top five. I don't, I don't think that's it. like it. So basically, we have the same list other than our number one other spots than our number being one and number two. Uh, Sinead, which one of us is right? Um, I have to agree that Maze Runner is going to be number one. I do believe that. But I think I agree with the rest of your list after the number one and number two. But our lists are the same. She's after a liar. Number one and number the, two. Well, didn't you guys have the visit and perfect guy flip flopped? No, he's. Uh, I got the visit at three. three. I got perfect I have guy the visit. at four. Yep, yeah. we're both visit at three. We're both visit, uh, the perfect okay, guy at four. So, ever so five. then, John, you're right. That's right. That's your way you're of doing telling you no. that you're <laughs> stupid. Maze Runner will, Maze Runner will be number one. Maze Runner <laughs> will be number one. She's trying to make one. me feel good about myself <laughs> because she didn't think that I would realize that she was talking about a different list. But I, I like your shirt. It. It's a great shirt. This <laughs> now, is what a drunk uncle should look like, guys. Now, of course, what if we follow the pattern, what's actually going to happen is the perfect guy is going to have like a 2000 theater expansion and yeah. it will be number one. And we'll both be eating crow. But that is our prediction. <laughs> Jump in the comment section and let us know your prediction. How do you see the top five running out this coming week. Leave it in the, don't forget, once you put it in the comments section, it's immortalized. It's there forever. And then watch everybody go back and delete their own comments. <laughs> but yeah, do that. Hey, those folks, I told you yesterday, since we didn't have any time for mailbag questions yesterday, that we would take make sure we'd take mailbag questions today. I lied. Uh, there was there was simply too much, too many items in movie news today. We just couldn't get around to it. I'm sorry, but don't worry. The weekend's coming. We got Saturday and Sunday mailbag shows coming at you where we'll get to a ton of your questions. So please forgive me. We won't make this mistake again. That'll do it for us, guys, for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. And don't forget, lots of great... Sh I was going to say, lots of great shows. <laughs> lots of great films. Playing over at our friends at AMC Theaters. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and movie ticket information. Don't forget about that contest we got going on for New York Comic Con. Look in the description of this video and find that link and you will find out how to enter yourself. And most important of all, subscribe to this YouTube channel. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting over here on my right, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you? I will be peddling my unique brand of box office idiocy tonight and tomorrow at the World Famous Comedy Store. Next week, I'm at the Atlanta Improv. You can get tickets at markelleslive.com, Twitter, 5150 Ellis. And of course, our lovely host today, Ms. Sinead DeFries. Sinead, where can people find you? I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Sinead DeFries and at that's so Sinead.com. And uh, you can follow me just on Facebook or on Twitter at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us for Collider Video. And until next time, bye bye. <laughs>